Excellent. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for session two of our Connecting Generations uh, dialogue series. We're very excited for today's event, um, talking about federal Indian law as part of your ECCR toolkit. Uh, we've got a great host of panelists and speakers joining us today. And uh, I'm very excited uh, to, to be part of the team pulling this together. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Stephanie Lucero. I'm the Native American Alaska Native Service Area Coordinator for the National Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution. And we're actually gonna start off a little different with some opening remarks from one of the Udall Foundation's board members, um, Eric Eberhard. And he's just gonna share a little bit about the National Center as well as um, the connection to, with the National Center to Environmental Collaboration and Conflict Resolution. For those of you that aren't familiar with Eric, he has over 50 years of experience in federal Indian law. He's been a board member for the Udall Foundation for over 20 years. And uh, he's generally a pretty small guy. Uh, so <laughs> very excited that he was willing to share at least some opening remarks via video. Hold on. <laughs> Removing the chat box from his video. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm my name is Eric Eberhard, and I'm happy to be able to join you today, even if it's remotely. Uh, I want to talk for just a few minutes about the history of the National Center, how it came to be, and uh, how it has grown and changed over the years. Uh, the National Center really started in uh, 1998, the year after uh, Mo Udall uh, died, and it was intended as a tribute to his work as uh, a member of the House of Representatives, and in particular, his incredible work as a negotiator and facilitator uh, during the time in particular that he was the chair of the what was then the House Committee on Interior and Natural Interior and Insular Affairs, pardon me. Uh, and that was from 1976 to 1990. He uh, had 2,700 pieces of legislation come before the committee. Uh, out of those, uh, about um, 1,800 were enacted into law. I'm, I paused there because I didn't want to overstate that, I, but I do think it was right around 1,800 that were finally enacted into law. Some took several tries, uh, the surface mining, um, Reclamation Act took uh, four tries before it got signed into law. It was sent to the White House four times and vetoed three times. Um, Mo was an amazingly intelligent uh, man. He had the ability to put aside personal differences and find common ground on any number of issues. Um, he was known for walking into a room full of people who were upset with him for something that he had proposed in legislation and walking out to applause. Uh, one of his skills was he was a, an incredibly strong listener. He knew how to listen intently and to respond directly to people. Uh, the thing that I think was uh, really the motivation that led to the enactment of the, the amendments uh, that be, for what became the National Center was his work in Arizona uh, establishing wilderness areas in the state. Uh, that was not very popular when he first proposed a wilderness area in the 1980s in, in Arizona, and it was a substantial uh, area of the state. Um, there were protests outside his offices in D.C. and in Arizona 
Uh, there were editorials written against the proposal. Um, community meetings were very heated. Uh, and Mo never flinched. He would walk into the room, he would sit down and he would listen. And he would employ his incredible wit and his gift for using humor to kind of take the tension out of the air. And then he would get people to start talking about what what their values were with respect to what they liked most about the state, what they wanted to see stay um, the way it it was in in the 1980s. And through that kind of back and forth, he was always able to tease out a little bit of agreement about uh, everybody's love for the land. Uh, even today, with Arizona being, uh, believe it or not, the most urban state in the nation in terms of where the population is, uh, one of the reasons people are there is because they love the state. They love the physical characteristics of the place. And Mo was able to use that as the basis for ultimately completely turning the tide and getting uh, popular support in the state, not only for his reelection, uh, <laughs> but also support for the legislation. Um, which was ultimately enacted. And there were four uh, sub subsequent uh, parts of the state that he was able to, to put into wilderness through the use of those skills. So when the legislation was first introduced in 1998, it was intended as uh, a way of trying to build on that record of using facilitation and negotiation to bring about consensus. Uh, at that time, uh, there were thousands of cases in the federal courts uh, addressing environmental conflicts around the country. Um, and most of them were not moving with, with any reasonable speed. They were taking a lot of time they were very expensive for everybody involved. So the idea was that if you could uh, establish in the federal government an entity that could be neutral and could uh, be available to the parties in some of those disputes, it might be possible to resolve them short of continuing lit litigation. Over time, that idea has broadened out and changed most recently in the 2019 amendments uh, that changed the idea uh, of environmental conflict resolution to uh, in what's really con consultation uh, and a, a more preemptive approach to resolving environmental disputes, reaching them before they really become disputes. And that uh, has, it was evident as uh, early as 2012, that that was the direction that the National Center needed to move in. And uh, we needed express authorization from Congress to be able to do that. I think, um, for all of you who are native, one of the things to, to think about as you look at uh, engaging in this kind of work is that it has deep, deep roots in native cultures. Uh, the idea of trying to bring people together to find common ground to resolve disputes uh, manifests itself in virtually every native culture that I'm familiar with uh, and has since time immemorial. It's, it's the idea of strong community and respect for one another at its core. And those were the same qualities that uh, Mo brought to his work to try to bring about uh, 
solutions to problems of all kinds, uh, whether it was through mediation and facilitation or whether it was through more formal means. His goal was always to try to find that common ground. And by doing so, to avoid uh, the zero sum outcomes that all too often are part of litigation and sometimes are part of legislation. Uh, if you can reach agreement in a community over the, the path forward, everybody stands to gain from that. And that was the basic idea. Uh, I want to touch it just very, very briefly on um, the fact that this is uh, part of the Udall Foundation. It's in part because that was uh, the best place to put it and the, the names matched, but it was also in part because a lot of what we do involves uh, developing and uh, supporting tribal governance uh, and educational opportunities for Native students, both as undergraduates and in graduate programs. Uh, from my perspective, the uh, National Center is just one more of those opportunities and programs for Native people around the country. All right. Well, a little bit of history of the National Center and a, a good launch in today's discussion about federal Indian law in environmental collaboration and conflict resolution. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Cordova, who will be moderating our panel of uh, great individuals today. So go ahead, Lauren. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Cordova. Um, I work with Stephanie and Ben. Uh, for the National Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution here at the Udall Foundation. I'm based in um, Washington, D.C., and um, I'm happy to be here today. I'm also Taos Pueblo and Shoshone Bannock. Um, so I just wanted to kick us off and introduce our wonderful speakers, who I'm so glad they could join us today. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that we're grateful to have them joining us in their uh, personal capacities. They're not here in a um, uh, official capacity at all. And we have them here to share their insights as experts in federal Indian law and to share some uh, experiences and, and real, um, real sort of, uh, sorry, conflict resolution skills. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, Rebecca Horsechie, and I'll let her go ahead and uh, introduce herself. You're on mute. That's like the thing we've heard for the past three years. <laughs> and I just did it, I, my apologies. So Hawaii. Dahe Dashe, Dahe Mingshe, Lajaje Jaje Wita, Monse Tsehi, Bahuska Zanzuoli, Basuoli, Mingshe Shki, Hampa de Hampa de Mache Daleha in Albuquerque right now. The sun is out. Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Horse Chief. I'm a citizen of the Great Osage Nation from Pahuska, Oklahoma, and I'm one of your panelists today. So before we get started, I need to impart a very important introductory disclaimer. I know Lauren mentioned this, but I'm here representing myself. I'm not serving in any federal capacity. Finally, I uh, would like to thank the Udall Foundation, Stephanie, Lauren, and Ben for their time and this great opportunity. So um, if you registered in advance, you would have received a document with an overview of, of terms and key concepts relating to federal Indian law as they arise in the environmental collaboration and conflict resolution field. And there's a disclaimer for details. That overview briefly summarized common terms, concepts, and areas in federal Indian relationships prevalent in ECCR interactions involving indigenous nations and the federal government. So please use it as an educational tool for further learning or exploring legal concepts with professionals. So uh, I love the law and I enjoy talking about the law, especially federal Indian law. Uh, you see federal Indian law involves a distinct body of law 
that relates to the legal relationship between the federal government and tribal nations. Federal Indian law is ever-evolving, it's dynamic, and it encompasses several hundred years of federal policies and interactions with tribal nations. The bones or structure of federal Indian law include principles of international law, so doc, doc, uh, doctrine of discovery, for example, the United States Constitution, federal statutes and regulations, treaties with tribal nations, executive orders, and judicial opinions, <laughs> so it's a lot. But now you can imagine that working in Indian country and federal Indian law has been, is, and continues to be described as complex for, I'll mention three reasons. So tribal nations, sovereign power. Every tribe, tribal nation is uh, distinct, especially with regards to how they, they're executing or exercising their power. There are treaty provisions or statutes affecting only one, tribe or a group of tribes, uh, Alaska, for example, you know, corporations, which affects their tribal jurisdiction. The federal law, the federal Indian law is vast. Um, thousands, again, upon thousands of statutes, treaties, regulations, and court decisions created by centuries, that's 100 years, of interactions between the federal government and tribes. And some tribal laws um, and some state statutes dealing with tribal nations adds to this complexity. And <laughs> federal Indian law is sometimes contradictory to itself because federal policy, it's oft, as it's often stated, um, operates on a pendulum, meaning it swings back and forth. So federal policies are sometimes supportive of tribal sovereignty, and then they're not, uh, thereby creating this pendulum swing of federal policy. So those are laws that are created on both sides of the pendulum, and, they, and the swing often remains in effect. So Termination, uh, relocation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, I'll talk more about that. But I want you to keep in mind that when cases go before, for instance, like SCOTUS or the Supreme Court of the United States, that swing and pendulum of law makes applying good law extremely difficult. It changes. And, and I'm, I'm like, but isn't it law? So um, whenever people look back at the history of the relationship between the federal government and tribes, sometimes they refer again to that swing as the pendulum of federal policies. And again, what they're talking about is over the last several hundred years, the federal government has changed its position and its policies on how to deal and work with Indian tribes or tribal nations. And some of these policies, um, like I mentioned, self-determination, termination, Indian reorganization, allotment, and assimilation. So it's constantly doing this, and we'll get into that briefly. So in addition to, in addition to or in spite of this complexity of Indian law, I want to bring your attention to some fundamental themes, principles, or tenets of federal Indian law that apply to the federal relationship with all tribes of the United States. So again, Inherent sovereignty, this is huge. The sovereignty or self-governing powers that tribes have are inherent powers. Inherent sovereignty means that tribes were already governing themselves before settlers came to America. And the United States recognizes those retained self-governing powers. Domestic dependent nations. Although tribes are recognized as having inherent sovereignty, they are recognized as being do domestic dependent nations. Tribes are domestic because they are within the boundaries of the United States. Um, they're dependent because they're subject to the power and responsibility of the federal government. And they're nations because they exercise sovereign powers over their people, property, and activities that affect them. And I can see a lot of the law students probably in this group are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> Owen, shivers of law school. Moving on to plenary power of Congress, Congress has broad power over Indian tribes. And this is part of that pendulum. This is, comes into play. Congress had brought, has broad power over Indian tribes and can limit tribal powers and or enhance them by delegating new powers or even terminate tribal status. And that's Menominee's. Um, government, to, that's a Menominee situation. Uh, government to government relationship. Federally recognized tribes have a government to government relationship with the federal government. Uh, this is a political relationship based on their retained inherent sovereignty rather than one based on race. Federal trust responsibility. The federal government has an obligation to protect tribes, their way of life, and to provide services such as education, housing, and healthcare to ensure their survival and welfare. This, um, basically, this obligation is primarily based on treaty promises to protect tribes 
and on the fact that American Indians and Alaskan Natives had Aboriginal claims to all land in America. So this is huge, but I'm going to break it up. U.S. Bill of Rights and Indian Civil Rights. So the United States Constitution Bill of Rights does not apply to the activities of tribal governments because as sovereign powers, and tribal nations, we predate the Constitution. And I love reminding people of that fact. It's the whole part of the whole three sovereign conversation that I have, if it comes up. Um, and then with the Indian Civil Rights Act, this act requires tribes to provide due process for anyone who falls under their jurisdiction and tribes, you know, oftentimes may not impose cruel or unusual punishment. That's a joke, the last part. Um, you have definitions for Indian country and the information that you would have received if you registered in advance. I only have a couple more. The canons of construction, uh, the three basic guidelines for interpreting Indian law cases are that ambiguities and treaties must be resolved in favor of tribes, must be interpreted as you know tribes and natives would have understood them, um, and Indian treaties and governments, I mean, agreements and laws must be construed liberally in favor of, the, of tribes. Double jeopardy, double jeopardy clause, the United States Constitution does not apply. Um, <clears throat> criminal jurisdiction over non-natives. Tribes do not have criminal, unfortunately, criminal jurisdiction over non-natives and cannot incarcerate them. Now, because there's a whole list that you would have received, that was just like some basic tenants, principles. Um, now, when we're thinking and talking about ECCR as it relates to Indian country, I would also have you keep in mind the tenants of ECCR, which are to systematically analyze conflict and collaborative opportunities design appropriate and effective collaboration and conflict resolution processes, manage conflict and build cooperation amongst diverse groups and teams, generate options, reach agreement, and document decisions to foster long-term commitments, and understand behaviors that build trust and cooperation. That sounds familiar, right? Sounds like peacemaking courts, sounds like conflict resolution, it sounds like traditional courts, Sounds like dispute resolution, arbitration, and even protests seeking environmental justice, et cetera. Um, these are options, and they may not be the best options for tribes, uh, to quote Stephanie, but it's what has worked for tribes. Um, tribes are interacting in ways in which these ECCR tenants are already embedded and have, engaged, have been engaged on the state level, the federal level, sometimes with both, and even between tribal nations. So what happens when tribal nations are collaborating and seeking environmental conflict resolution absent federal interjection? Um, what does and or what would it look like? What happened at Cannonball? Was the DAPL catastrophe an ECCR opportunity? And what about Chaco as an ECCR opportunity? Um, did it only affect Pueblos? Uh, what about the Navajo communities living there? So without taking too much of your time, I'd like to offer uh, a segue to our next panelist to provide more uh, con um, context for the, the federal Indian law primer that I've just provided. So thank you very much. <laughs> and that's my part of it. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was, that was, those are some uh, really great connections. Um, and thanks for laying those out there, very thorough. Um, so next, we're going to, as you provided that segue, uh, kick it over to Santi Lewis, um, and I'll, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself, and uh, then we'll hear your remarks. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. Yat a um she Santi Lewis Yanishia, Hishka Hanzo, Nishlando Hanzo, Bashishin, Kizilthana Dashchedo, Tachini Dashnoa, Akwad Adana, Asan Nishlam. Good morning. My name is Santi Lewis. I am of the Yucca Fruit Strung Out and Line, born for the Meadow people, and I am a member of the Navajo Nation. Um, and so, in um, so I guess uh, I know Rebecca personally, and um, I think when she was talking about environmental conflict and resolution, um, I shared a story with her. Um, um, about something that, that I had encountered in my capacity as the executive director for the Navajo Nation Washington office. And, and um, it was really, um, it was really um, I guess, a, a, a pleasure to be invited to this group to, to share that conversation with, that I had with Rebecca. Um, but 
um, just as a little background, um, back in 2019, I was appointed by then President Jonathan Nez, <clears throat> excuse me, and Vice President Myron Weiser to serve as the executive director. And under the laws of the Navajo Nation, the executive director bears the responsibility of representing the Navajo Nation um, in Washington, DC, and in its dealings with um, the federal government. So that, uh, uh, well, with federal government agencies, the White House and Congress. And if you guys can, you, you know, take yourselves back to 2019. Um, th at that time, President Nez, um, you know, as just recognizing that he would, uh, it's it's one of the largest sovereign nations in the country, and um, many members of Congress approach him um, as like to seeking support of whatever legislation they are passing, and at that time, um, um, then Secretary Holland was. Um, a congresswoman for the state of New Mexico and her office approached President Nez. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Before I go any further, um, because I am currently an employee with the Department of Interior, I currently serve as the superintendent for the Southern Pueblos Agency. And so the view, the statement views and opinions I express do not represent the views of the BIA or the Department of the Interior. So I just wanted just to make that disclaimer. Um, but at that time, he was being approached by various members to support her um, legislation. At the time, she introduced legislation to essentially put around um, Chaco Canyon, which is the historical site that, that's um, behind me in this picture. And what they were going to create was a 10-mile buffer zone. And, at, and for President Nez, he wanted to make sure that he did his due diligence in terms of researching the matter and um, making sure that he was understanding what Navajo's position should be because he was approached by various stakeholders internal to the Navajo Nation. And it was our task as the, um, uh, um, j just working with federal agencies, it, it, it was our task to put together um, a position paper for the president and to research the, the, the different um, perspectives that Navajo people had. And, and it actually turned out to be a very co complex issue. Um, so on one hand, you have um, Native Americans, um, and, and I say that broadly because there's a lot of Native Americans who are you know, we consider ourselves our um, like stewards of the land, like the first stewards of of the land. Um, I think n naturally we have a, a connection to nature. And so um, Native Americans, Pueblo tribes, they were really interested in stopping all oil and gas activity around the, the greater Chaco region. And on the other hand, I don't think that this is very um, um, well. It's it's been made more public recently, but but there was a um, there were Navajo landowners who rely on oil and gas income for their livelihood. So um, just to just to give you guys an um, um, an insight as to how much there was, there's actually 50 leased allotments to 5,500 Navajo landowners that receive over $6 million in oil and gas royalties within that 10 mile buffer zone. So it had a huge impact on Navajo landowners. Um, and if and if folks attended any of the public forums, many of the um, landowners are elders. Many of them spoke about how they rely on that on royalty income. So for so if the federal government was going to stop all oil and gas leasing in the Chaco region, it would have a devastating impact on their livelihood. And so I think it's really important to also understand that um, around Chaco, um, what the department was saying was that we are going to stop oil and gas leasing for all federal lands. And so they so they also admitted that it would have no impact on any of the private land holdings or any of the individual allotments. But what folks don't quite understand is that the way that oil and gas leases are put out to bid, 
is they have to um, have unitization agreements where um, the the unit like units of land are put out to bid and they may comprise of you know federal land indian allotments state lands and so if you're pooling all of the um, small federal pieces of land you're effectively stopping oil and gas happening oil and gas leasing activities for the navajo allottees and so um so i thought so going through um like having conversations with federal agencies in my capacity as executive director i found that it was very um just because of the complexity of this issue and because of all the different um um aspects that 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 sort of like come together in this issue it was really hard for um for folks and I say that broadly, folks to educate one another about how complex this issue is. It's not about like the environment versus, um, you know, like like protecting Chaco for the sake of environment. You're also impacting Indian land owner interests, and also if if the if the federal government had, I mean, right now they are in a. Um, They've, they are currently considering a 20-year withdrawal of lands within the 10-mile radius. But if you actually look at the map, um, the buffer zone, it actually goes outside of the like 10 miles. Um, I think folks felt like the federal government wasn't being honest with them when they're saying that there is this 10-mile buffer zone. Um, landowners also felt like even though they state that it that this action does not apply, it still has a devastating impact. And then I think another point that landowners were trying to make was that why even have a buffer zone? Because um, arguably, when a national park is created, um, they they take into account how much of the park should be protected and and if this and if this moves forward this would be the first um, national park uh, across the country that has any kind of buffer zone so those are some of the um um i guess points that landowners brought up to the navajo nation and um and i think that president nez and, and navajo leadership in general were positioned, well, they were in a very difficult put position, but also they started to also question the, the, the trust responsibility that the federal government owes to um, the, 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 the Navajo tribe as a tribe. And then also the Indian landowners, they, they are also owed um, that trust, um, trust responsibility as individual landowners. And the federal government also holds that land in trust for Indian landowners, and so um, I'm sure that that the that the federal government is weighing its responsibilities to all of these different stakeholders, including um, the environment. And also, I think for Navajo Navajo landowners, they wanted to they felt like the the recent actions by um, by Deb Holland in her role as secretary could also be um, a conflict of interest, just recognizing that she was a Pueblo woman. Um, and also, you know, she's a, she is a representative of the federal government as cabinet secretary. So I think folks were just kind of wondering, um, you know, what what is what is the what is like why why push this issue further? Um, but also for Navajo, um, they didn't hear about any concerns prior to when the legislation was introduced. And so I think that when we talk about conflict resolution, I think it's really important to one, understand um, the different perspectives that tribes have, but also the, um, like, especially in this case, you have so many stakeholders and, 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 and trying to find a consensus, I think is gonna be very interesting going forward. So, so I just wanted just to um, introduce this um, emerging 
issue, if you will. I think it's it, it's something that we will continue to see, um, I guess, uh, develop. And um, and I think that's that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you. Thanks, Santi. Um, yeah, interesting. I just want to thank you for that insight because um, I think it is important to highlight when there are so many different um, views and and uh, interests at stake, ECCR and of course federal Indian law empowered ECCR can provide that equitable platform for everybody. So thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. And um, next we're going to go to our final speaker, Troy Ward, um, and I'll let Troy introduce himself. And then after that, we are going to go into the dialogue portion of the um, session. So just, you know, get your thinking hats on and try and come up with some questions and we'll ask you guys to plop those into the chat. Um, but for now, I'll let Troy take it away. Hi, thank you, Ms. Cordova. I'm going to go to Ms. Chukma, Troy Ward, Micha Chakasiroki at Oklahoma. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's well. My name is Troy Ward. Uh, I'm from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, from the Six Towns Clan. Um, there's a lot of good information um, put out there today by my friend Rebecca and by Ms. Lewis. I'm very um, grateful to be following two, two fantastic Native ladies like that. Um, there's some really important points that are brought out as well. Um, I have had a lot of experience on the ground since since before I was a lawyer. I was when I was a law clerk. Um, I was deeply immersed in all of these different all different players that have something to say with regards to environmental concerns. That are, um, as Rebecca stated, we have hundreds of years as Native people of experience in trying to live in an, an ever changing landscape of legal of the law as applied to Native people, federal law, state law, um, and politics that swing on a pendulum back and forth. Um, and I don't think it's um, any, any, anything short of a miracle that Native people still have um, their sovereignty and still have nations. I think the, the intelligence of Native people and the ability to negotiate and politic straight up. Um, I think that's really what why we are here. And I'm grateful to hear that there or to learn that there was a program like this, um, ECCR um, being put put forward and hopefully being, you know, being properly supported, which I believe it is, to be able to interject into these situations that I mean, 99, maybe not 99%, but most of the time when a tribe is in a, entered into a confrontation, a legal confrontation with a corporation, with a state, with anybody, there's a huge percentage of the chance it's going to be, the outcome is going to be negative for the tribe. Um, and so that puts a very strong impetus or, or motivation on the tribe to negotiate. Um, and as Rebecca pointed out, you know, politics change. The, the Supreme Court has changed vastly in the last few years. We don't really know what that's going to look like. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so we don't really know what the Supreme Court's going to do over time, but, you know, um, how, how much of all that did you hear? <laughs> We heard all of it. You're you're coming through fine. It's just uh, it was a little rough at the beginning. So, sorry okay. to interrupt you. Okay. Um. So let me get into some of my direct experience with regards to um, negotiating out things or or opportunities where I think could have been made a vast change. Um. As um. As stated into my uh, my bio or the introduction to me in the in the in the documents that were forwarded out to everybody, um, 
I work, I've worked in litigation nonstop since I got my license. And one of the things that I worked on just before I got out of law school was the, a, an amicus brief for Dakota Access. And I learned a whole lot about that, the whole situation there. And one of the takeaways, well, there was a bunch of different takeaways, but one of the takeaways for me was that the state and the federal folks involved were probably not as aware as they as they could have been about a very old relationship between uh, the three affiliated tribes and the Lakota people. There have been conflicts between those folks for much longer than there have been Europeans around. <laughs> and so, I mean, taking that into, a, in a, into account, into a negotiating type of situation is important. If you, if you don't know that these people have not, have do not, are not going to get along very well, um, or have not got along for a long time, you're, you're not going in as a properly equipped negotiator, in my opinion. Um, so that's a good piece of information to know. Um, also, um, you know, how could the tribes have gotten, have ramped up some of the leverage they have to create a better place to negotiate from with uh, energy transfer partners or some of the other players involved? Um, how could we support them to put them on an even playing field at the negotiating table? Um, that could have been accomplished with a number of different things. Um, or there could have been, for example, under the Hearth Act, there's um, ways that tribes can enact their own environmental controls for their land. It's approved by the Secretary of Interior. Um, and it's from that point forward, everybody's got to follow those rules that wants to do anything that affects the environment on tribal land. There's also the Clean Water Act. How could that have been put into play? That was the one of the major disputes was how that, how the black snake, how that pipeline might affect the water supply. You know, um, under the Clean Water Act, tribes can apply for treatment as a state. And I'm not sure whether either of those main, of those big groups of tribes have, were looking into that at the time or had already gotten that, but um you know how do we how do we support them um how do we put that knowledge out there who does those ne negotiations who's the best person to put out there right um i would argue that we have a whole lot of of native lawyers and and, and native people who have a, the training to be able to see both sides to you know walk in both worlds so to speak so that you, you can talk to both sides and see um, where there might be some kind of middle ground or solution that'll work. Because as um, Santee and Rebecca said, this often is a very, it's a zero sum game. Actually, I think it was the, the introdu introductory speaker who said that litigation is a zero sum game, especially for the tribes, you know, um, and you know, it's not going to, usually not going to end up very good if it goes to court. Um, so it behooves everybody to get, to figure out how to negotiate these things out before they get ugly. Um, you know, and other situations where I have seen it, things fail is where, um, a, for example, a tribe here in New Mexico wanted to build a very large solar farm. And there were, there were a lot of players in that in the energy production industry vying for that same market, you know, selling that same amount of power. Um, and nobody was really able to negotiate on behalf of that tribe effectively. There wasn't really anybody there. Um, and that would have been an excellent opportunity. And how does, how does that involve the environment or environmental conflict resolution? Well, I mean, we're talking about changing from changing a, a from a you know fossil fuel related um power source to solar um but also the the way that the tribe had to go to go to do that was through the hearth act by enacting its own environmental regulations so that that corporation could come on the land and install all the solar equipment and so forth and so on um but before it ever got there there the negotiations fell apart between PNM and the other players for where that power is going to go. Um, and I wished 
in in both of those situations, Dapple and I, and with that particular situation, that that there were there was a way or somebody to call and like, hey, you know, help us negotiate this, help us figure this out, please. Um, so I'm very very happy to have been called upon to speak about my experiences and to lend whatever support that I can to this effort. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Troy. Um, I really, I really like that you kind of tied that connection back to like walking in two worlds, because I think that that's something that we as like uh, native professionals hear a lot is like, how do you, how do you find that balance, and how do you use one side to inform the other? And I think that's um kind of what ECCR is all about as well like and especially if we're talking about bringing more native folks into the ECCR field like that is very important to keep in mind that like um traditional knowledge is just as valuable as um you know like a education in the western world or you know having a law degree is just is important but having the experience from you know navigating conflicts in Indian country uh is just as valuable that knowledge that we bring from all of these different experiences we can put it all together and use it to um inform our conflict resolution so thank you for sharing that um so next we'll actually go ahead and get into our um our dialogue portion, our discussion portion of the session. Um, so I just wanted to see if anyone, any of our participants wanted to drop any questions into the chat box, or if you wanted to raise your hand, if you have any burning questions about um, anything that the speaker shared or um, anything federal Indian law related that would apply to ECCR. Let me just check the chat box here. Laura, and I might jump in mm -hmm. as co-facilitator prerogative. Sure. Um, and just point out a couple of things that I thought were really uh, great insights from all of our panelists. And thank you again to all of you for sharing. Um, I think Santee talked about this a little bit, but it, it also kind of permeated through all the discussions is this concept of um, real and perceived impartiality, the both the ability to walk in two worlds, as Troy mentioned, but also ensuring that participants trust that there's not, not a personal conflict of interest and kind of that struggle, particularly for um, Indigenous uh, facilitators and mediators, and just generally, um, you know, where those affiliations stand. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's a difficult path to walk. Uh, and I think it's a difficult path to walk for any facilitator or mediator to kind of be there for the peop the participants and, and al allow that space for them to share their concerns. But I was wondering if you had any additional thoughts, um, maybe for our Indigenous uh, facilitators, mediators, or folks that are interested in pursuing this field in terms of, you know, walking that path and, and walking between those two worlds. Oh, well, thanks for the question. Um, I think, um, I think one, it's, it's just to have, um, I think what was interesting um, is, Whenever you would see Navajo or Pueblo or like different stakeholders come together, um, there was always some acknowledgement of like respect and or, or or just just coming to the table with some humility and um, and I think like that went a long way because because those who came to the table to actually have a conversation about this weren't the weren't folks who were um, like rioting outside or, you know, they're, they're, they're very angry or folks who didn't want to hear what Navajo's 
position was. So I think that whenever you come into um, negotiations, you have to be willing to hear the other side and, and, and try to understand or like have some empathy and um, just, just to just hear them out and not to cut them off. Um, I think that that was really essential whenever we heard from Navajo landowners, it was allowing the mother to go on a tangent about how she was raised and um, perhaps why, why that royalty income meant so much to her family and, and, and how that income has changed their lives. And then on the other hand, you may have um, um, someone who wants to see, um, well, who has a lot of respect for, you know, the, the, the Chaco and ruins and, and they want to make sure that there is no oil and gas drilling in the area. So, um, so, so I know that when it comes to negotiations, um, it's, it's, it, especially in tribal communities, you have to give enough time. Um, you, you can't cut off people and, and, and just come with a willingness to like, listen. And I think Troy may want to also add on to that. May I? Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I think for me, um, to the question that I, as I understood it, was was kind of how how might a conflict or how might you deal with a, an allegation or some kind of assumption that you have a conflict of interest between as a native person negotiating in this way? Is that is that right? Okay, um, for this as a, a um, just as a litigating attorney, I would say, just use your rules of professional conduct, like go straight to it. Like there's nothing in there that talks about traditional concerns or any of that stuff when it comes to a conflict of interest. Um, so if a per, if I never, let's, let's say for example, if I never represented um, Standing Rock Sioux, um, I don't have a conflict of interest you know, or energy transfer partners or any of those people. Um, it's, it's, I think that that, like, it gets dangerous if we try to start importing all of our tribal relations into conflict of interest cons considerations because, because yeah, I could eat, I could tell you right now that I worry about every single Indian law case and how it's going to affect my people, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have an interest in how every case comes out. But I don't. I don't necessarily want that written into anybody's laws. <laughs> um, um, so that's how how I would, um, you know, how I would answer that question. Rebecca, did you want to add anything? No, that's great. I was actually looking at the chat and deciding who should answer what, but I see that Susan Goodwin asked about the DOI's policies on uh, stewardship of our natural resources. I think it's so, me personally and acting out of my capacity again, because I do work for DOI, mm -hmm. but as an average person, Indian person, <laughs> I really like that co-stewardship of public lands. Oh my gosh, this is so amazing because really without having to spell it out, but because I know there's a, a broader audience online, um, you know, um, indigenous communities, and I'll just speak for the two that I most associate with, Pawnee and Osage, we've always had a way of uh, providing, you know, good and, good and succinct stewardship of our lands, use of, protection of, um, care for, and, uh, protect, you know, again, protection of lands. And so if that's a, an effort that's implemented at the highest level with regards to like National Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, I think, who are all the players, um, but if it, you know, it, it relates to like Bears Ears National Monument, it relates to Confederate Salish, their bison management, it relates to the Rappahannock Tribal Homelands, this is just for starters, um, I think it's going to be great, now how it actually plays out, how they're approaching this, how that how that manifests now those are the bigger questions that i have but as 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 a as an initial declaration and how this is happening i it's tremendous it's never happened before i don't know that another administration has thought hmm 
let me think about working with tribes because they seem to, you know, have taken care of the land and provided, you know, awesome stewardship. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I think it's great. Oh, the fish hashery for Nez Pierce. That's the other one. So that that's my perspective. Thanks, Rebecca. And Troy, I think you indicated you had some thoughts on this question as well. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I have the same concern or thought about, about, you know, tribal engagement with ECCR or, you know, that there will be hesitation um, simply because it from outside, maybe outside of the, the box, it looks like another federal actor, um, you know, or something like that. Um, but there's, I think that there might be ways to create, um, for example, let's say that you had, um, you, you did this on a different, you did the relationship between, um, the federal agency over the ECSR, EC between, or at least a bubble between the federal government and the negotiators. Um, one idea that comes to mind is just um, doing that through a contract. I mean, contracting out to different um, uh, negotiating, different consulting agencies or, or firms and bringing together a team to handle it. I don't know. Um, I don't, I think that there's ways to structure these, the negotiating or negotiators that would make the tribes feel a lot better. That's my opinion. And Troy, I'm wondering, are you are you speaking to, I think Seth's question in the chat was, um, you know, the benefits yeah, for tribes on ECCR. No worries, no worries. I just want to make sure folks are tracking. That comes up a lot. I mean, Seth's question is something we see a lot in um, the National Center in terms of creating an ECCR process where tribes feel comfortable in um, engaging in that process with the multi-stakeholders and the, the group problem solving, but also making sure that they're maintaining their sovereign dis sovereign relationship. Um, and it's, it is a really tricky process. And I think for me, I feel like a better understanding of what ECCR can be done either by the tribe as well as by the, the other parties in the group and as well as understanding that sovereign relationship are kind of key. So I appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts on that too. And thanks Seth for the question. Did you have anything to add to that question, Seth? Oh, oops, uh, mute again. <laughs> um, not really. I was just curious if if the panelists had any additional thoughts on that. You know, it's something as having facilitated different processes where I see that, and I'm like, gosh, it would be great if they if the you know this a particular tribe engaged at the staff level because they could bring great, they could educate the other members more on the issues that might lead to a result that actually benefits them. But at the same time, they may choose not to participate because they'd rather just engage directly with the agency outside of that process. So, and that, and that make, that can make sense, right. For whatever reason, but they, they may not be then they may not be part of that other dialogue that's going to go on regardless um and so that's that's kind of what i was thinking about and just thinking how can we or should we or could we or encourage that in future challenges like on water drought in the west whatever it might be thanks Seth. We're getting a lot of really great questions and comments in the chat. I did want to um, go back to Susan's question, Rebecca. You were you were commenting on um, appreciating the co stewardship of natural resources, and you mentioned the how as an issue for that. I'm wondering, um, Rebecca, Santee, or Troy, do you see a role in environmental collaboration, conflict resolution, and kind of the implementation of those policies and what that might look like? I absolutely see an, uh, an opportunity to both collaborate and will enter into ECCR. However, I, it goes back to the, the conversation between Troy and I believe Seth, you know, it's, it's that, again, it's that pendulum. Again, I, I know that's much like federal engine law, you know, we've got something good happening here, 
but that not every tribe is the same and not every tribe's policies are the same and they're not they're not all wanting to engage in the same way so then it comes back over here and what does that mean and then if one tribe acts in one capacity you know it's always about especially with law it's always about what's the domino effect if something happens here how is it affecting other tribes so if we're able to independently we the royal we of tribes we're able to independently engage in a capacity that's specific to that you know nation I mean, that's one thing, but if it's a template for overall, I think it's, it's troublesome, even though you would think, oh, code steward, co-stewardship, but there isn't, is it, a, is it a weird, strange, small attack on tribal sovereignty, like we've seen with some of the cases before the Supreme Court, right? Even though it's a good thing, we have to, we have to be aware on so many different levels, I feel like, I mean, Troy and Santee may have a different perspective. But Troy is a practicing attorney in Indian country. Santi, you know, in her capacity, uh, we're not in our capacities, but her purview of her experience in this world, right? What that looks like. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Santi or Troy, did you have any additional thoughts? I was just thinking about, um, well, I agree with Rebecca in that, you know, it's it's a great, um, I guess, vision for the department, like co-stewardship, because you want to make sure that tribes are part of the decision-making process. And I think that that's where it goes to the ECCR process in terms of like collaboration, trying to reach um, agreements and, and, and have these long-term relationships. Um, with specifically with Bears Ears, you have so many tribes in that area who are going to be part of that process. You have Navajo, the, the Paiutes, um, and I think those are the only two that come to mind, forgive me, but <clears throat> but I know that there's so many others, and, and, and there's a lot of bands of Paiutes too. Um, but I think one of the interesting conversations that, that we were having at that time you know, like when, like right before this was going to be made public was, I know that there's a lot of ancestral claims to different areas by each of the tribes. And so I, I really, um, I don't know what co-stewardship looks like. And then, and then when there are competing interests, you know, tribe versus tribe, which tribe is going to win? Or, or 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 how is that going to be resolved? And so I think like that's a component of the co-stewardship that really isn't quite fleshed out, which is what about intertribal disputes? Um, how are those going to be mediated? And perhaps that's where we can look at like what ECCR is designing as a as a system, and hopefully we can see that employed at that time. Um, that's all that I um, that's all I wanted to offer. Um, I, if I may, real briefly. Absolutely. I would. Um, I would. For this question, I would um, kind of piggyback off of, of something that Rebecca mentioned earlier, which was that um, politics change a lot. Um, you know, and when you the difference between what we're talking about as a DOI policy and legislation like the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, for example, those are two very different bodies of structures or rules. You know, it's it's like move, you got to move some mountains to change the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Um, but the DOI policies are not, not so difficult to change. You just wait a little while and they're going to change. <laughs> um, so, um, I think that is something that makes me hesitate, but also I think the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and the way that it has played out is for, is re with regards to how states and tribes have to interact have, could be very instructive um, because it's a win. I mean, if you look across Indian country, that is, it's a win. There have been losses. There have been situations and cases where tribes have lost um, or think the powers that tribes have been narrowed and but overall it's a huge win um and so and i think that the nigc is is usually the arbiter of disputes like that um is that where we're headed with this i mean i would think that 
like legislation that would put it in place firmer would be great. And an agency like call it a CCR, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that's my thoughts on it. Hey, Stephanie, I had another question. I had another thought. So also we're on the tail end of a specific, again, to mentor, with, to piggyback off on Troy, we're regarding politics. We are almost at the tail end of a, of a particular administration. And I don't want to, I want to be careful about this. I think everybody understands what I'm saying. So there's this offer to co-steward these lands. And so in essence, you know, tribes will get into, well, enter into conversations about, you know, because this would be a, the best example, right, of an intertribal, Bears Ears would, Santi, right, for managing an intertribal sort of uh, ECCR situation, because we're, they're thinking about options, they're talking about reaching agreement, they're talking about, you know, documenting decisions, and also, just as we've mentioned separately offline, a lot of how we engage as, you know, folks working in Indian country without even thinking about it, you know, these ECCR uh, ways of life are, you know, deeply embedded in our, in our, in our ways. And so if we're engaging in an intertribal sort of uh, perspective, and then another administration comes in and decides that's not on their dashboard, you know, so that does it, does it sit on a shelf at that point? Um, at what point does it become a, a commitment? You know, it's just, um, I have so many questions, but without being too, um, without wanting to sound negative, I I think it's it's I I know that it's an awesome start and 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 we're headed in the right direction with this. So, but really just relating it back to ECCR, it's it's the best opportunity to do what we've always done as nation to nation sort of like uh, agreements and situations. But I'm wondering if that's always the route to take you know, separate from this co-stewardship. So my mind is rolling. Well, it's it's actually great. I don't know if you saw the questions or comments from Sarah Van Norman. It's a great segue to what Sarah was sharing oh. um, about, you know, that sometimes tribes only have a choice to litigate. And so, you know, ECCR, I'm, I am paraphrasing, Sarah, what you're providing. <laughs> you, you had a great comment in there, but um, really thinking through that ECCR is one pathway, but litigation may be the, the choice that tribes have to um, perceive. And, you know, I think your second comment, Sarah, about, you know, you're getting resistance um, yeah. uh, from some federal agencies or other groups about doing ECCR. And, um, you know, one of the, the uh, pieces of ECCR and, and conflict resolution in general, which I think Santee, you pointed out, people have to come to that table willing mm -hmm. to listen and collaborate and participate in that process or it won't succeed. Um, so just thinking through Sarah's comment um, and being responsive to that, and I wanted to see if uh, Rebecca or Santi or Troy, you had any additional thoughts. Um, Sarah's comments, I'll, I'll let Sarah's comments stand for themselves uh, at 12 p.m., but I thought that was a really important point to make. So thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the panelists for looking at it. I will say, um, Ms. Van Norman, that I agree. I, I I didn't mean to say that I don't think there's a place for litigation. Obviously, I would be out of a job, but um, <laughs> I, but, I didn't take it personally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think I was just trying to emphasize that just from a risk management point of view, you got to be real honest about it when you're looking at litigation with with a tribe, you know. But yes, it, and also what what um sorry which which i want to say which district but which court which appellate court are you in has a lot to do with it are you in the couldn't agree yeah, more are you in the fifth are you in the tenth eighth you know, yeah yeah we're in the eighth and i will also know i mean and this is just it depends on resources just like you said um there's a lot of space um that various tribes in my region are evaluating how do we use our state processes effectively um, because you know tribes traditionally and for great reasons are allergic to state court but sometimes there's some really important things that you can do there that you can't do easily in federal court um, uh, for for whatever reasons of procedure but 
Um, yeah, there's some interesting things that you can, that's another discussion, but there you go. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Don't don't leave any any stone unturned or any tool off the table, right? So. Yeah, because then we'll start to start to have our we'll have to start talking about McGirt if we go there, uh, Sarah. <laughs> uh, which means we have to talk about Castro Huerta, which I do not need to do anymore today. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's exactly. Today. <laughs> it's a it's a whole other webinar. Yeah, for sure. Lauren, I, I think we've got almost everybody's questions from the chat, except for um, Dana had a question very specific on federal Indian law. So another good segue. Um, how often are the canons of construction applied by the courts? Do they typically rely on it or does it vary a lot? Which perfect segue. Roy. Really? <laughs> oh gosh, it depends. <laughs> Um, I would say they are being applied more frequently than in the past. Um, I think it's, it's a process, um, that, that's all I really want to say about that. I don't want to get too off into the weeds on that, but, um, I mean, like some of the best cases I've seen where the canons of constructions were construction were applied completely faithfully, then they just get tossed out at the appellate level. Um, you know, so I mean, I think it's like I said, it's a process. There's they're still being implemented, I think, in the federal landscape. They're not all the way there yet. That's just my thought. Thanks, Troy. Rebecca, Santi, did you want to add anything to that? I, I, oh, Santi, go ahead. Sorry. No? Okay. So I, I think it's nice to, to see that it's something that's... I can read and write about. I don't always see it in practice. And that's why I laugh. I think it was applicable at a certain time and it's just, you know, it's just there right now. It's I know that is... <laughs> what, what did you say, Troy? I said it's more of an ideal. Yeah. That, it... You know, at one point, aspirational yeah I for me I almost feel like it gets to what all of you were sharing earlier as well is both federal Indian law the law in general and then even just thinking through ECCR as a tool for individual tribes or, or an individual situation it's also fact specific and so like really looking at all those facts looking at the tribe looking at the history um, looking at the treaties, looking at the laws that have been applied or have they been applied? Does the tribe have Clean Water Act, uh, tribes of state status? Um, what's the history of their, it, it, all of that, you know, which district are you in? It, it's such a complex issue and there's so many issues to look at. It's, um, that's where it kind of resonates for me. I think Dana had a follow-up question. Um, and I am particularly in the, um, you know, because we look at multi-party and kind of including everybody who might feel impacted by a given environmental conflict when we do environmental collaboration and conflict resolution. Dana's question was with respect to if there's any thoughts about the dynamics of having both federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes at a negotiating table. And I will preface that, um, you know, in some situations I've seen where the federally recognized tribes support that, and some situations I've seen where the federally recognized tribes do not want the non-federally recognized tribes at the table. Um, so either one, <laughs> if you have any thoughts on that. And I, I, I've I seen that come up I'll, a lot. I'll Go ahead, Troy. 
Um, I think this one, this to echo something that um, both Ms. Lewis and Ms. Horsechief have, have said, and and Ms. Lucero, Ms. Cordova, um, the, it's a situational sort of thing. I mean, I think it would very much depend on who those folks are and what their relationship to each other is. That's the first question I would ask. Um, maybe it's great. Maybe maybe like for example, I'll speak about my my own tribe. Um, we helped assisted um, the Janavana Choctaws and the Mississippi Banna Choctaws become federally recognized. So we have a very long relationship with them and fully supportive of that. Um, also very far apart geographically. So it's hard to imagine an environmental issue that would where uh, you know in the past or maybe Mississippi was state recognized and not federally recognized. It's hard to imagine an environmental conflict where that might play, but just to state that the tri the federally recognized tribe may be supportive of federal of federal recognition or their rights or something like that. Or they may not be. There may be competition for resources and there may be old relationships that we don't know about. Um, but but it would be really um, I think it would be good to have, to have any anybody because I mean like I was saying Mississippi wasn't or Jenna wasn't um, federally recognized but they are now so you got to consider that the, the, the state recognized tribe may be a federally recognized tribe soon or in the future you know so it's a great thing to think about though and introduce into the dialogue Just want to check and see if Santi or Rebecca wanted to add to that at all. I I was just going to um, mention that it it also depends on what they're um, going to be coming to the table for as well, um, because I know that one of the some of the more contentious issues I've seen always has to come down to funding, and so when it comes like between like I guess the sharing of resources between federal and federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes, um, those do tend to be quite interesting to observe. Um, but I think that for the most part, what, what, what I have seen um, is for, for tribes who are not federally recognized, there's generally um, support for them to, to gain federal recognition. So I'm really glad that Troy pointed out that even though they are not federally recognized right now, there, there, there may be a path for federal re recognition in the near future. So I think that, um, you know, we, we still want to try to um, keep those relationships going like positive because you don't know when you know you, you may need their support for something so just something to consider or think about too thanks uh rebecca did you want to add anything yeah excuse me i was having to cough oh yeah um that's a really good question. And like Santi, I, the first thing I thought of is it comes, it always comes down to funding, you know, it always comes down to funding. And, and then that goes back to, you know, who created this system of federal recognition. And then it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. And it's a whole other conversation, but the dynamics specifically, I'm sure they'd be great dynamics. If we're talking about co-stewardship of like public lands, I think it'd be an awesome conversation. But again, going back to this co-stewardship, you know, is there funding available? Who has access to funding? And typically, you know, with these um, agencies, again, speaking, you know, as an individual who's looked at these websites, typically funding is 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 not optional. It's only for federally recognized tribes. So, if you know the engagement, if the dynamic of that engagement is that you know there's um, an offer or willingness for you know non federally recognized tribes to participate in in a discussion of dialogue that only one, you know, some or none tribes will benefit from. I mean, those are some interesting dynamics, you know, but maybe that's where it starts. Maybe that's where it starts, but those would definitely be some interesting dynamics. And I wonder if there's funding for this and what that looks like, you know, because 
stewardship is more than just, you know, I'm going to do this and then I forget because I get busy. It's what are my, you know, physical, what are my tangible, what are my non-tangible, what are my collaborative sort of like um, uh, requirements, what's required of me. Uh, so, or the tribe or tribal nation, because oftentimes funding is not for individuals, it's for tribes or tribal nations. So that's the other thing. So <clears throat> the dynamics would be very interesting. Thanks, Rebecca. I know you're having a hard time there with your cough. Um, <laughs> hopefully you got some cough drops there on standby. Um, but I just want to, um, I think we're going to start wrapping up. I think we got to uh, all of our questions that were dropped in the chat. Um, and I just want to thank our uh, speakers again, our panel. Um, you guys made this session so valuable and we just want to express our gratitude for how in depth um, you all went with these questions and, and with your presentations and, um, you know, just the uh, complexity and potential legal considerations that can arise in ECCR, like really going into detail on that, that was great. And uh, I just wanted to see if there was anything else that Santi or Troy or Rebecca, any of you wanted to share before we uh, start to close out here? I will just say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, th thank you for the opportunity to be here today as well and for your time and, to, and for your participation. Um, I just wanted just to, I guess like when I was um, thinking about um, you know, just going back to the Chaco issue and Navajo Nation's participation, the federal government's partic participation, and and I'm just really curious about how the government is go going to reach its decision. And so I think that I just wanted just to um, put that question out here to all of you guys, which is how how do how do you think that the government makes de decisions when they're dealing with so many sovereigns? tribal sovereigns, how, how, like, just really, you, you know, just, just think about it. And then also, um, how do you know when um, a negotiator knows that they have reached a consensus? Because I think those were really difficult questions that we, um, that, like, for the Navajo Nation, I think it was just, just seeing what Navajo leadership had to deal with, I think it was really difficult for them to reach a consensus internally. And I don't think that they ever had. Um, and so I just wanted just to put that out there, something to just think about. And um, and, 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 and if you ever find yourself in, in that facilitator role, um, you know, you, you have a big task ahead of you. <laughs> but thank you again for your time. And um, I, I appreciated being here and um, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Santi. Thanks for posing that question, that challenge to all of us. Um, that's great. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and drop into the chat um, some information on our last two upcoming sessions in this webinar series. Um, so as you all know, this is the second in our four-part series. Um, so please join us. You can pre-register or just register a day of for session three and session four. Session three will be on uh, April 7th. It'll be a uh, building community, connecting participants, any CCR practitioners through stories from the field. Um, the original intent of that session was to provide mentorship in the um, community of practice. So we're really looking forward to that. We will also be sharing some hypotheticals in that session, uh, which Troy will hopefully be joining us for and possibly the uh, other panelists here, but we'll see. Um, and then session four is May 19th, and that session will be on correlations between ECCR and the overall health and well-being of Native communities. That one is 
going to be the culmination of this series, and we're hoping to draw some connections there. Um, so if you could please um, share this out with uh, anyone you think might be interested in your networks, and um, you know we'll be in touch soon, and I'll just uh, pass it over to Stephanie to see if she has anything to close us out. But thank you so much to everyone that joined us today. Yeah, thank you so much. And just a reminder, um, we had thought of doing another session um, this month, and we, we decided for our sanity, we're going to just push it to the April 7th date. Um, and then we added on the May 19th. So if you see a disconnect with the previous save the date, um, that's what happened. So we will be meeting again in the dialogue series on April 7th. Um, we added the May 19th. Um, we would, if you are interested in either putting together, participating, um, or engaging with these sessions, please reach out. Um, we will be sending the links to this recorded session as well as the first uh, session one um, via the email that you registered with. Uh, so we will send those out to you. Um, please feel free to share with anyone that might be interested, anyone who's interested in this field um, or would benefit from it. Uh, we really want this to be a long lasting uh, tool and resource uh, for Indigenous and non-Indigenous practitioners uh, seeking better solutions for self-governance and better solutions to addressing conflicts involving the environment, natural resources, and public lands. Um, so, so much gratitude to Lauren Cordova for putting this session together. Uh, gratitude to uh, our speakers and panelists as well for your time and, and your thoughtful um, comments and, and sharing and, and to all of you joining us today and taking the time to uh, engage with us and sit on the webinar and look forward to seeing you again. So with that, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful weekend um, and take care. Hi folks. <laughs>